It's finally happening. What? The greatest debate. The insufferable ache in my heel. The burning question that napes at the back of my neck. Ever so gently. Ever so persistently. Have you been seeing them? Seeing who? The comments. I never read comments. That's just asking for trouble. Well, I posted a short of my rejected master's portfolio and now my art kryptonite is back and I can't avoid discussing it anymore. It? The same critique I'll never escape. I mean, these comments actually seem pretty nice to me. The eternal question. Aesthetics, hoodie. Aesthetics. You mean like how good something looks? Oh, it's much deeper than that. It's the question that tears at the very foundation and expansion of this field. The question, what is art? What's best? What's most valid? The question is so deep and vast. It's philosophical. It's historical. It's even practical. But I'm finally going to tackle it. Just try not to overthink it. You're reading a touch dramatic. I'm ready. <sighs> what is art? That is the question. <laughs> Welcome to the great art debate. The ultimate quandary of aesthetics. Aesthetics versus concept. Enjoy. Today is scripted. Welcome back to the Robin Sealer channel. You may have heard of Marcel Duchamp's scandalous artwork, The Fountain. A flipped urinal signed R. Mutt and exhibited to the great dismay of some onlookers. But have you heard of Martin Creed's installation piece number 227, The Lights Going On and Off? This piece consists of an empty room in which the lights automatically switch on and off in five second intervals. And in 2001, it was exhibited at Tate Britain and won UK's most publicized art award, representing all medium, the Turner Prize. This installation was acquired by Tate Britain and is valued at over £100,000, though to some critics like Louisa Buck, who described it in 2013 as the Tate acquired it, it is an important work and a sober minimalist piece in a long line of artists using everyday materials for potent formal and psychological effect. Others, like David Lee in the Times said, last year the Tate was scraping the barrel. This year they're scraping the scrapings. A light being switched on and off is not a good work of art. And artist Jacqueline Crofton, who threw eggs at the empty walls of Creed's room in protest to the prize, declared Creed's presentations were not real art and quoted, painting is in danger of becoming an extinct skill in this country. Art has evolved deeply in practice and definition through the years, and within that evolution has come a debate between schools of thought over the purpose, motivation, and value to art. Today, I want to talk about the spectrum of this argument and how it affects you and I in the modern art world. I've gotten really interesting and helpful feedback on my rejected master's portfolio from y'all. It's been majorly bringing me back to my university years. Academic institutions ask you to think in a more critical and expounding way than I personally do in my average post-undergrad life. In fact, scripting this video, I ended up taking a week gap to process all of the thoughts rising from this research. And it brought me to a personal question. Am I using art to tune in or to tune out? The purpose and scope of art has been discussed in a thousand settings. For today's approach, I'm going to come at it anecdotally. I'll be sharing stories from perspectives of professors, working artists in various genres, my subscribers, contemporary and traditional art philosophy and artist statements in our ed curriculum that I personally have researched and written. Whether you're coming from the perspective of a student, a teacher, hobbyist, collector, appreciator, or working artist, this debate has rolling impacts on the work you make and engage with. For that reason, I think it's important that we finally discuss the great art debate 
together. Please join the conversation in the comments. Your thoughts fill out the discussion with important additional experiences and perspectives for community growth. Even if you're not an artist, like I said, I like to paint pretty pictures. And I have a long record of primarily engaging with the technical and beautiful parts of making. It started with loving how mastering realism reflected my efforts and scrupulosity, but also grew from validation I got from my mom and my high school art teacher. <laughs> when you are first learning, replication is a great means by which to demonstrate technical understanding. But going into my undergrad, I got a lot more pushback. While technical study may have helped me to be admitted to the program, our group discussions and critiques were aimed at moving beyond skill demonstration to personal interest, narrative, and perspective sharing. I encountered totally new to me contemporary perspectives from my professors. We discussed the evolution of art genres and dove into new media projects like video, performance, and installation art. At times, my brain and mouth push back against these expanding artist perspectives, and sometimes I wondered if I might have been better suited being in the illustration program, which carried heavier emphasis on technical proficiency. But the fine arts program ultimately challenged and expanded me to be a better, more open-minded artist and educator. In later years, I found out that not all local artists agreed with my program's approach to art, but I'll get into that story a little bit later. First, I want to show you some of the valuable artists that I was exposed to to uh, expand my perspective. If you'll take a trip with me over to Pinterest, I pulled together a number of artists I'd like to share with you. Welcome to a brief initiation into the world of a few new genre artists I was introduced to at school that you might like. Ernesto Neto is one of the installation artists on this board. Part of the role of his artwork is in connecting things, people, space, ideas, stretching things to their limit, mimicking biological construction, the body, environment, life, tactile structures. Here's the weather project by Olafur Eliasson. This becomes a piece about shared human experience re-examining natural phenomenon by creating a false indoor sun. Felix Gonzalez Torres lost his partner due to complications from AIDS. This pile of candy is added to to remain at a weight of about 175 pounds in order to symbolize a form of resurrection and remembering in this portrait of Ross. Arena Warning does a photo series in which she recreates youth photos with adults. Cindy Sherman uses photography to document herself as different caricatures, often with a film aesthetic and narrative tone. Jeanette Eckelman was supposed to do painting on a trip, but when she shipped ahead her supplies, they never arrived. She was in a fishing village, so she began to use netting in order to create sculptures, and now she makes illuminated hung nets in public spaces. Ai Weiwei makes art that often challenges the Chinese Communist Party. This piece includes 100 million porcelain sunflower seeds. Each was hand-painted. The process required 1,600 workers and two and a half years. It was produced in the Imperial Porcelain Capital. Christo and Jean-Claude have made public art space works that interact with environment and often are on large scales that allow for participation from the public. Similarly does Jenny Holzer with her projections and Rachel White Reed, another Turner Prize winning artwork called House. It is a concrete cast mold of the entire inside of a house. It's said that her work is much like riddles, doors you can't open, windows you can't go through. Sandy Skokland is a photographer and arranges installation pieces scenes with characters and interesting composition and color. There are more artists on this board if you want to check them out. These examples represent artists with very different goals and experience to little old me tinkering away with most value placed on how my student work would be visually accepted. I'll say these artists are much more conceptually developed than I was as a teen attempting new genre assignments, but I'm very glad I was pushed to think and work in alternate ways to break from my own conventions because I think it is important to face challenges 
and failures. On conceptual failures, a deep loss of mine is the original performance video I accidentally fully freaked out my new genre class with. In order to test the clarity of our intentions and messaging, we would have to present conceptual work and listen to its critique without a preemptive word, and boy, was that a good lesson for me realizing that people can perceive your art wildly different than you intended. There are lost 2012-ish Robin video pieces I would so love hate to embarrass myself with had I the opportunity still. RIP. <laughs> While I did make a variety of different art genres for my degree and I was exposed to different artistic philosophies, I still found myself clean to this question. How could I lead with an aesthetic intent and then embed more conceptual value and meaning into it secondarily. <laughs> My favorite artist in those years was the contemporary portrait artist Jenny Morgan, and in addition to pouring over her techniques to combine traditional realism with provoking color and composition, I also poured through her artist statements and interviews because I wanted to know how I could similarly express meaningful artist statements that reflected my unique artistic aims in such a historic subject matter. In this quest, I found philosophy on the concept of hyperreality relating to escapism, and I explored this concept a bit because hyperrealism was a style I liked putting into my portrait paintings. While realism aims in revealing the truth and attempt to represent subject matter without artificiality, and photorealists are said to be trying to reclaim and exalt the value of an image, hyperreality deals in an inability of consciousness to distinguish reality from fantasy, and it is described as the compression of perceptions of reality where what is generally regarded as real and what is understood as fiction are seamlessly blended together in experiences that blur distinction. According to Dr. S. Devika, fulfillment or happiness is found through simulation and imitation of the transient reality rather than interaction with any real reality. Basically, hyperreality takes what's physically real and exaggerates it through lenses of interpretation. I was looking into these distinctions in preparation to write artist statements about my work with contemporary portraiture, but I actually came into my most concept-driven work through different life events that made me change my focus from portraiture to exploring the metaphorical ties between death and water for my senior thesis show. I researched the artist Bill Viola, who works in video and performance art, to depict similar ideas, though through a more Christian-inspired symbology, including the addition of fire to accompany water. Creating for my senior show, Tides, brought me a deeper level of connection between my thoughts and visual expression. Art became a tool to grieve losing my dad, and transitioning from a portrait to landscape work helped me to connect to home and family concepts. But in years following this subject transition, I stopped considering the deeper concept in my landscapes as heavily and have mainly reattached to aesthetic motivation and appreciation for nature's ephemeral beauty. The more I make landscapes, the more creating them becomes a brain off, body on, flow state. And flow state is a wonderful, happy experience. It's therapeutic to have a pursuit you can lose time into. Something that takes you near fully into your body, which can give you a much appreciated reprieve from being in your mind. But I'm beginning to feel that my personal growth lies in a balance of body and mind. In times I crave personal expansion, like right now, I wonder, do I need 
concept to elevate, individualize, and connect with others through my work. Would clear messaging deepen the impact of the time I spend in the arts? Some years ago, post-graduation, I began feeling the itch for studying art again. This was before I looked into the masters, but was looking into something more akin to an apprenticeship. I found an intensive 30 weekly hour program with an incredible technical painter. In meetings, we discussed the art program I graduated from, and he shared very strong contrary views on art to the more contemporary new genre informed view that I had been taught. His work carries a range of intent from commissioned portraits to religious multi-figure scenes designed through technical architectural drawings, constructed dioramas, costumed mannequins, and live models positioned on lifts to aid in realistic perspective drawing. He takes his craft precision and professionalism very seriously. From this commitment to traditional methodology and materials, I believe was born his perspective, one in which he debates my professor's classification of art because of a belief that conceptually driven new genre work undercuts traditional art skill. I think his views relate to the school of thought that can be exemplified in my earlier story about Martin Creed's prize winning the lights going on and off installation. Like how the artist Jacqueline Crofton declared Creed's presentation put painting in danger of becoming an extinct skill, my potential mentor was of a similar opinion that capital A, art, is a skill built on wisdom past historical tradition and technique that become jeopardized by the inclusion of heavily conceptual work being comparatively judged against each other in elevated art spaces. This is because it steps away from the development of the long-standing practice that some see as deserving a protected classification as to not undercut mastery within that given field. Reminiscing, I remember being of a more similar mindset when I first was exposed to new genre and it frustrated my pre-existing judgments. During that time, I continually was pushing back on critique that my work was somehow superficial for pursuing a how do you do that visual motive. Today, I try to embrace a fairly inclusive perspective. While I think there are real social, political, and financial incentives that sometimes interfere with an unbiased, uh, higher perception of art, I also have a lot of respect for artists like the ones I showed you on Pinterest and how memorable they are because of the thought-provoking intention they embed into their practice, the ways they participate in expanding the art field, and how inventive the creativity is that they display. When I look back at earlier work that I made, I see how much it looks like student work or assignments, and I don't think you need to be on the absolute edge of either view of this debate, but I do think that understanding each side helps me to move beyond more generic, impersonal work to work with more visible character. Though sometimes I find passionate argument for one view very interesting, I believe there are more moderate ways in which you can value both concept and beauty in creative work. I'm of course no expert in conceptual artistry, but I do believe as I exercise more intention into my pieces, I'll demonstrate deeper growth in my work through time. I want to highlight comments that have given me good food for thought about my portfolio and determining goals and intentions for my art. This one comes from a chromatic yam. It's likely your work doesn't have clear narrative or style in the fine art sense. It doesn't explore deeply and push past itself. It's incredibly comfortable work, which really isn't the point of an MFA. If you know what you want, Want to do, you probably don't need an MFA. I don't think it would benefit you at this point. Do things that you're curious about or that make you uncomfortable. Hannah Lemsifer said, I wonder if they were feeling like they couldn't get a sense of who you are through your works. I think many professors seek out the why behind the moves made in the body of work. How you intentionally chose certain compositions, lights, colors, style, techniques. 
I think they have a proclivity to lean more toward candidates who are able to represent who they are as a person, what they're interested in, what they're thinking about and care about. I've heard somewhere that they look for things they admit they can't teach you. And then Miss Monison, what do you call this portfolio series? I believe what they're looking for in a master's program is a theme. Do the paintings relate to each other so they can be displayed in a gallery as a theme? That's a question my BFA professors asked me. I think that going into higher education, it's important to be set on what you are looking to get out of it. I'm not sure if that's where I'm gonna end up ultimately, but I am very interested in continuing down some of these lines of inquiry. There is a possibility I'll be doing a solo show next year, so in preparation for that, this conversation might be something that I use to develop a body of work. I think that arcing narratives make for an interesting show, but as I become more aware of this possibility, I will share stuff with you because I would absolutely love if some of you were able to come. But yeah, let me know your thoughts on this debate. Do you get stirred up on either side of the argument? Are there artworks that piss you off? Do you have a concept present in the work that you make? And what is art? Thank you for watching. Check out my artwork on robinsealark.com or by checking my socials at robinsealark. And if you subscribe, we'll catch up in another video soon. Thanks for watching. Bye. Like the video.